These are two world-class wildlife photographers, but they're also just a downright inspirational couple. When did each of you start in this, this lifelong pursuit of, of photography? I'll start first because I started first. There you go. He's older. <laughs> and I started when I was in about eighth grade. By the time I was in a, a junior in high school, luckily enough, National Wildlife Federation had a, a film library that they were going through at that time. That, that kind of like uh, supplemented my whole high school and early college uh, photography career because I was able to sell photos through them. Second grade, I got a Brownie Instamatic camera with a flash where you had, actually had to lick the, the flash bulbs to put them into the camera and everything. Mm -hmm. She what? still licks the uh, back I, I still of, sometimes. Of, uh, hot shoe flashes. It's, uh... Yeah, I can't, can't break the old habit. When did the two of you meet? And, and maybe, maybe give me a little bit of that story. I'll try to without getting too emotional. <laughs> uh, I took a, uh, or I, I, I was teaching photo workshops, and uh, Mary met me at a lecture that I was giving at a bird club and uh, decided to take the course that, that winter in the Everglades. And, and oh, basically, yeah. I fell in love with the instructor, had to convince him that I was necessary for his business, and uh, <laughs> the rest is history. I, I mean, it was like um, he opened me up to the world of photography, and I, it was just like this creative bloom went off inside of me. In a way, it, it almost defines my existence. Um, it's almost like a like a, a religious experience in in, uh, in in taking the photographs that it's uh, like celebrating nature. I really think that uh, that's my operating premise. Well, we also, you know, like I said before, if we don't take an image, that's okay because we have this whole library of images which we call neurochromes up in our brain of things that we've seen throughout the years, and it's almost like. Um, when, when we're out there, it, it reinvigorates us. It just hmm. fills us back up. You become one with it. And then to be able to document that, to use it for educational purposes for kids or for adults, to share it with, you know, with, with the rest of the world and to try to save it in that aspect, it's pretty special. Hmm. I, drew I drew pictures before I ever took a photograph. And uh, although I dabbled with, you know, like drawing ever since then, you know, just, just as kind of like a, a fun thing. He does great acrylic painting and we have stuff in our house from him. So don't oh. let him kid you. Wow. But the point is that, uh, even in, uh, in like looking at the world as like a painter or a, mm -hmm. an, an artist, you see things that you absolutely don't see. Uh, mm -hmm. to give you an example, uh, I've often been tempted to make just an outline of a zebra and take it to on my safaris and then put it down at the uh, the table where we all have lunch and give everyone a pencil and say okay fill in the stripes on a zebra and i'm sure most would have no idea which way the patterns would go you know how they would go around the flanks and how they come around the, the the legs and the face you know and how the stripes go up because we look at things and we classify them and then we dismiss them with the photography, because we love the natural history and the wildlife and everything, um, and we are immersed in it so much, and we get to places that many people don't, we actually get to see, I think, more firsthand the conflict that's going on between wildlife and man a lot mm -hmm. of times. Mm -hmm. And it's easy for us to condemn man for like the, the poaching and stuff. But we also get to see the other side of the coin with the poverty and what might be going on, why there is poaching or why there's encroachment. And sometimes it's totally wrong on the human's part, but other times there has to be a balance. And I, I think we get to see more of that balance versus other people. And, and hopefully then we can, through our talks with people or through the images or through articles, we can help to bring that balance to others' education on stuff. I wanted to be able to step out the door and not have to worry about paying for a, a, a gallon of gas, but be able to take photographs just literally outside the doorstep. Tell us a little bit about the wildlife friends that you have around you. That, I'll answer first, only because <laughs> it's a little piece of heaven here. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like we can walk right out the back door, right out our porch and photograph it. And we've dug ponds in the back, vernal ponds for the wood frogs to to you know, mate and everything and, and to have tons of tadpoles. And it's, it's just fun to be able to give back, you know, so much by, by creating this habitat. 
and there was this overwhelming sense of, man, I'm alive right now. Um, it happened in the end of November, one day before my birthday. Um, we were in Rwanda on our 75th gorilla trek. Mm -hmm. But as they started to go back up into the woods, into the national park, another group a, called the Hero Group came. And Gohunda, who's the head silverback of Sabino, running past us. When you know when something's going to happen, because he puffs his lips, if I can do it. And then what he was doing was something we had never seen before. The two main silverbacks were good. gone. Wow. And it was just wild. The photography just added to being able to capture it and then share it later and still look at it and still be so excited from what you wow. saw. And I had a camera laying down on the ground at the time and the silverback ran by like a freight train and uh, his foot just missed the camera. Mm -hmm. He was that close. But had he moved even another two feet over, his shoulder <laughs> would have hit any of us and just flipped wow. us over the ledge because we were right there, at the edge of a, uh, a, farm, terrace field. a farm terrace. So, but I mean, to really almost like uh, have the hairs of the gorilla brush your face, it was ran by it. Was, it was cool. It was Amazing. pretty good. BBC and both that and Nature's Best both had it as like the second place winner that year. So mm -hmm. it was a striking shot. What you forgot to mention though, it was seven male lions. So we're talking seven big male lions on this kill. And as, as my story continues, <laughs> <laughs> it was like if you're climbing and you get scared, my leg was rubber. It was just, you know, like oh. shaking. And, and I was aware of that shaking and thinking, this is really cool because wow. I am like, I am so juiced up that my body is responding to this, you know. You look like you're in a spaceship. If I hit that, I actually blast off. So it's it's okay. dangerous. No, see, then it goes to full screen. Right on the corner, can't pick it. No, I tried. Oh, I hate this computer. Okay, how's that? I think this is working better. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> we have so many lights on. <laughs> we'll just strip down here for the cameras. Okay. <laughs> the cat is sitting to the side, and she usually comes up my desk. Hopefully, we won't have a tail in front. There, there goes your tail. <laughs>